Hey guys, what's up? It's Clay. Welcome to another video. Today I'm going to be talking about something that I'm calling the five pillars of relationship. And this is a topic that I kind of came up with, and it's basically what I think the building blocks of a relationship are. And in a, in a way, you can kind of score yourself on this scale uh, to kind of determine how healthy your relationship is. So I came up with this maybe a little over a year ago. And at the time I was having some relationship issues of my own and I was kind of at the, just doing everything that I could think of at the time to try to figure out what was wrong and then hopefully fix it. All right, so what is the five pillars of relationship? It's kind of this theory I've come up with and none of these things are new ideas. Um, I kind of just sort of took a bunch of ideas, thought about it a lot, packaged it up and kind of made this framework to help me anyway, kind of gauge the health of a relationship and kind of identify things that you need to work on. And at first glance, I don't want people to get confused with things like the love languages. This is, this is different than that. So the love languages, if you've looked them up, are sort of ways that people express their love. This is different than that. This is the building blocks of a functional relationship. And it's not just how you express yourself. It basically is sort of the underlying foundation that makes a healthy relationship in the first place. And then, you know, once you have that foundation, once you have that healthy relationship, I guess the love languages would be more how you express a lot of these things. So it is different. I just wanted to point that out first of all. So the first thing I'm gonna do here is just define each of these five pillars. And then after I've done that, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about how to apply that to sort of, I don't wanna say classifying a relationship or scoring a relationship, but kind of determining the overall health of a relationship. I've also got some ideas about, you know, what happens, can you substitute any of these pillars? If you're not getting one of these pillars in your relationship, can you, you know, get a friend to substitute that? And so I've got some ideas on that as well. I'll talk about that after I introduce each of these five pillars. All right, so the first pillar of my five pillars of relationship is emotional intimacy. And you may have heard me talk about this before. I did a whole video on emotional intimacy. I'll link it below. If you want to go more in depth on the topic, you can click on that link. But basically, emotional intimacy is the emotional connection between two people, the level of trust, acceptance, um, understanding. So some researchers came up with a scale on sort of how to rate emotional intimacy in a relationship. And it's five items long. And so I'm just going to read those here. So the first one, the person completely accepts me as I am. Two, I can openly share my deepest thoughts and feelings with this person. Three, this person cares deeply for me. Four, this person would willingly help me in any way. Number five, my thoughts and feelings are understood and affirmed by this person. So you might notice a bit of a trend here. There's a lot of acceptance, love, understanding, trust, and almost patience. So if two people have a deep level of emotional intimacy, they can share their deepest selves with the other person and they're not gonna be ridiculed or told them they're stupid or they're not gonna be, none of that information is gonna be used uh, to manipulate the other person. And the only way you really get there is with a deep level of trust and it's built over time. So sometimes you can have one person that wants emotional intimacy and the other person doesn't really want it for whatever reason. Some people just don't like to open up. Maybe they don't trust this person and they don't want to open up to this person. Um, you know, a lot of people, they end up in these relationships and as time goes on, they, they might realize that, you know, maybe they don't trust this person. Maybe there's issues. Maybe there's emotional abuse going on. Maybe there's uh, personality disorders like narcissism or, you know, Antisocial personality disorder, I mean, there's lots of different personality disorders, but there's lots of reasons people can have to not trust another person. So all these things are kind of hindrance is to emotional intimacy. So, you know, if you've got one person in a relationship that really wants that emotional intimacy and another person that's kind of pushing it away, it's a really hard thing because you can't force emotional intimacy on anybody. It basically is both people sort of coming together willingly. And so I think that's why true, deep emotional connection is a very valuable thing that should be cherished. And I think it's actually more rare than people want to admit. So anyway, that's the first thing, emotional intimacy. I think it is basically the most important of these five pillars and absolutely vital to 
a really strong relationship. So the second pillar of the five pillars is what I'm calling intellectual intimacy. And I actually searched this on the internet and found some articles and it is a, an actual term. So intellectual intimacy is more like intellectual stimulation. Like you guys stimulate each other in an intellectual way. It's like kind of a measure of how well does a couple kind of compliment each other or validate each other on their thoughts, ideas, interests, like their job um, or their passions or just things that they're interested in. Naturally, people, when they're interested in something, will want to talk about it. So how well does the other person kind of validate that and encourage that um, without making the person feel like a weirdo or anything like that? In a lot of ways, emotional intimacy and intellectual intimacy, they kind of overlap in a way. So for example, like you might be sharing your thoughts, it might be an intellectual thought or an opinion on a topic, and that probably is more like intellectual intimacy. But then if it kind of moves into a more emotional state and how you feel about it, so that's more like an emotional connection that you're looking for. So ideally, kind of intellectual intimacy and emotional intimacy go together really well. So I want to kind of clarify on something here because a lot of times if you have one person who's just a really intellectual person and has lots of things to share and you have another person that's a great listener and just sits there and listens and kind of just agrees with everything that person says, at first glance that might sound like, oh, they have a good intellectual uh, relationship. But I wanted to point out that kind of true intellectual intimacy is kind of a back and forth thing. So, you know, one person shares their thoughts and ideas or, you know, shares something that they're working on. And so the other person has a bit of a unique perspective on that and maybe gives some ideas back. And it's a dialogue. It's a conversation. Uh, it's communication. It's not just one person lecturing the other person, almost like they're like a school teacher. Here's all the things that I learned and, and thought about today. So it's more like equals coming together and having a discussion and kind of stimulating each other intellectually. Um, it's something that I've kind of noticed is I require a little bit of intellectual stimulation in my relationships, a romantic relationship or even friendships. And if there's none of that, like if there's no sharing of ideas or um, opinions or, you know, ways that the world could be bettered or, you know, anything like that. Talk about something that interests you and I'm usually fairly interested to hear about it. Like let's say you're really good at, I don't know, I'm just make. say you're a knife maker. I'd like to hear about how knives are made, you know? But I have noticed that there's some people that just really don't like to get into intellectual conversations. And so I think that this is one place that's a little tricky because if you have one person that's sort of at a different level intellectually than the other person, they might have a little lower levels of intellectual intimacy. Because because I've, I've had this in my life where I talk about certain things, talk, talk about certain ideas that might be challenging to people. And to be honest, I think it kind of freaks some people out, even though I don't think it's a big deal. Like I think in my family growing up, we talked about ideas. We talked about all kinds of stuff. And so sometimes when I come across people that really don't have that expectation, and it's more just like, let's just hang out and be chill and don't talk about any deep stuff. I find that a little, I don't want to say boring, but I don't find it very stimulating. So I would say that's, you know, a low level of intellectual intimacy if I were to find that in a relationship. So another, another thing about intellectual intimacy, it's like a desire to listen to your partner, even if you're not interested in the topic, you know what I mean? Or you're not, it's not a topic that you yourself are interested in, but they're interested in it and you still engage in conversation in that topic. So there was a study uh, I read about that I thought was interesting, and it was couples that play games together um, are more likely to have kind of a higher level of intellectual accept acceptance because they're used to challenging each other on an intellectual level through playing games. They're used to a little bit of competition. They say that those couples, couples that play games together and kind of enjoy that interaction with each other are less likely to need, you know, 
intervention with like couples counseling. If you're able to challenge each other and you know, offer each other ideas, offer each other perspectives, maybe point out things that the other person could work on, right? And they are able to accept that and listen to you and understand and then actually come to a compromise and try to work on a problem. That is a really good sign, I would say. I think the key thing about any relationship is communication. If you can communicate and understand each other and actually listen to each other, you can work things out. And what is communication? So in my opinion, communication is basically just a combination of emotional and intellectual intimacy. You're basically, you can share your feelings, you can share your thoughts, you can share your observations, you can share facts. So what's an example, a kind of a concrete example of intellectual intimacy? You know, a couple where a person comes home and the other person just naturally wants to hear about their day. What did they do today? Where, like, what, what, did, they, what did they do at work? Um, like, what were you thinking about today? Like, is there anything challenging that happened to you? Anything that, you know, caused you to learn or grow? You know, any new ideas? Um, versus a couple where, you know, somebody comes home and they just really don't talk about anything of depth, I guess. I feel like I've talked quite a bit and I'm only at the third pillar. But the third pillar is a little more straightforward, and that is physical or sexual intimacy. Um, sometimes people try to differentiate these two things as separate things. I decided to put them into kind of one category because I think, to be honest, it's a bit of a blurred line between real physical and sexual intimacy. A lot of times, you know, good physical intimacy just kind of blends right into sexual intimacy. So what is physical or sexual intimacy? I think it's that connection you have with a person when you are physically or sexually close. And so here's the thing about it all. I think, this is my opinion anyway, that good sexual intimacy is directly built upon good emotional intimacy. And I'm not sure. I mean, these are all my opinions, by the way. A lot of this stuff isn't like peer-reviewed research. But in my opinion, I don't even know if you can have really good physical or sexual intimacy without first having good emotional intimacy. You know, in a sexual relationship, if you are accepted, you are understood, like you know this person loves you and is willing to do anything for you, and you trust that, immediately that person is going to be more physically and sexually attractive to you. Because there's something about that emotional connection when you experience it. It just sort of ignites a bit of a sexual passion, I guess you could say. You know, unless you're not sexually attracted to a person and it's just more of a friendship. But I'm talking like a more romantic relationship. So if you're really close to somebody emotionally, I think you can have better sexual intimacy. So I guess it raises the question, can you have good sexual intimacy with a person without first having emotional intimacy? It seems like without good emotional intimacy, you won't have a high level of trust with a person. And so if you don't have a high level of trust with a person, can you really have good sexual intimacy? Um, I would kind of think no. I think you can still have sexual gratification. I mean, you can have sexual gratification with nobody around, but all by yourself. So, and there's no sexual intimacy involved with just yourself. So I think basically it's safe to assume that good sexual intimacy is different than just having sex. So basically, I don't think just sex by itself is intimacy. And then what is physical intimacy? So I think physical intimacy is similar to sexual intimacy, but it could be things like, you know, things that aren't completely sexual, like let's just say cuddling or physical affection towards each other. Or it could be things like, you know, dancing. Um, I think why for me it appears a little bit of a blurred line is because a lot of times, I think if you have good intimacy, physical intimacy will naturally become a little sexual. Like if you're cuddling on a couch, I can see how that could easily be blurred into a bit of sexual intimacy or going more towards sex. Anyway, a bit of a weird topic to talk about on a YouTube video, but that is the third pillar. Let's move on to the fourth one. All right, so the fourth pillar of relationship is shared values. And 
these are things that I think people don't take serious enough in the beginning. They think they're not going to be as big of a deal as they can end up being. But what are they? You know, things like cultural views, religious views, societal norms, like family responsibilities. Like it could be upbringing related things. Let's say a girl is raised in a super conservative religious family. She's going to naturally end up with ideas of what's expected of a man and a woman in that context. Let's say a boy um, is raised in a different kind of family, non-religious and a lot more equality between men and women. Women are expected to work just as hard as a man, like things like this. And at first, you know, they might maybe even attracted to the differences. But then as time goes on, they're either going to have to work those issues out or there's going to be a lot of contention as the woman then expects certain things that that man is not going to provide because he was not raised that way. So what else could this be? It could be any kind of like social, cultural norm, things like career versus family, like what's more important. Um, is a career more important or is your family more important? Should women be staying at home with the kids or should they be working? Religious views are a huge one, obviously. Um, in a lot of religions, you basically have to get married inside the religion. If you don't, you know, there's going to be some huge problems because people are expected to behave in a certain way. And if one person isn't part of that religion, they're not going to behave that way. In some countries, political views could be an example of shared values. If you have somebody who's like far right and then somebody else who's far left, that's going to create a bit of contention in the relationship if they're both passionate about those beliefs and unable to compromise on them. So another example would be like kids versus no kids. I've actually seen this multiple times and it's always amazing to me. So two people get married, but they don't really talk about kids that much. And then a few years go by down the road, all of a sudden one of the people are like, okay, I'm ready to have kids. And the other person's like, whoa, what are you talking about? I don't really want to have kids. And it's kind of this hush-hush topic for whatever reason before you get married to really state your intentions. Because I think a lot of people don't want to admit that they're getting married for such practical reasons as shared values. But in the end, if one person's super adamant about having kids and another person is really adamant about not having kids, like what do you do? Sometimes people have this deep internal desire to have kids and now they're denied that, that could create resentment. So if somebody comes together and they've got a bunch of shared values, let's say they had similar upbringings and they actually have the same beliefs. Uh, maybe they have similar political views. They, same, they view culture and society in a similar way. Those people are going to just have a much easier time in a relationship setting because you're not going to have those things kind of driving um, the relationship apart. Not too complicated, shared values, but I think it's more important than people realize. So the fifth pillar of relationship, in my opinion, is quality time slash shared interests. So quality time is obviously spending time together, um, doing things together that you both enjoy. And not just being in the same place together, doing the same things, but actually experiencing things together and enjoying each other in that moment. Like let's say, for example, you are in a relationship, you've got kids and you have a date night. Let's say once a week you have a date night. You kind of have a choice on that date night how to spend that time. And there are ways that you could spend it having quality time and there is ways that you could spend it not having quality time. So let's say you both have a shared interest and you really love some activity. Like let's say you really both love cooking. You know, if you guys cook a meal together and in that time you can talk and share things with each other, if you've got really good emotional intimacy, good intellectual intimacy, you can create a bit of a bonding moment in that cooking time. So, but it kind of raises the point. There's ways to turn a quality time like that into a non-quality time, I guess you could say. It's the difference between the two of you going out and enjoying each other, doing an activity that you like, um, but let's say now one person invites a friend or invites another couple. Now you're in a double date. And so now you're not really sharing. This isn't quality time anymore because you're, you're hanging out with the other people. It's more like social time. And you know, social time is really great too, but it's still different than quality time. And I really want to point that out. 
I think bad relationships, or maybe I shouldn't say bad, but maybe unhealthy relationships, they'll look for ways to cheat on the quality time. So instead of going out for dinner and talking and having a good night, um, they might go to a movie theater instead and basically not talk to each other the whole time. And that's not to say that going to movies is bad. I love going to movies as well. But what I'm trying to say is if that is your definition of quality time, you might be missing the mark. Another thing about this is I think a lot of people, they almost try to like, let's just carve out a little bit of time at the end of the day to have our quality time. But I think what's better is if you can actually have quality time throughout the day. So obviously that's harder if you work away from each other, but let's say in the mornings while you're getting ready, if you can kind of communicate a little bit, maybe have a little extra time to have breakfast together, having dinner together is great. And then, you know, as you go throughout your evening, just having these little moments along the way to talk, I think that can go a long way to kind of building that, that feeling. All right, so I want to raise the whole thing about emotional intimacy again and why I think it is vital that you have that in a relationship. And here is why. If you don't have emotional intimacy, that means you don't have a deep level of understanding and acceptance and you can't, you don't really feel like you can share yourself with this person. So a lot of people have a deep need for emotional intimacy in their life. Like I know I do, for example. I feel like I need somebody that I can connect with on a deep level. Otherwise I start to feel quite alienated and alone. So I feel like if I have just one person in my life that I can connect on that level, I feel like that's sort of a basic need for me and it makes me feel a lot better to feel understood. And I'm not sure if that makes me weak or not, but I think life is better with another person that understands you. So let's now say that you're in a relationship where you don't have that. You don't have emotional intimacy. And so now you go and try to find that with somebody else, like let's say a good friend, and you start building that level of emotional intimacy. I think it creates a bit of a, an awkward situation. There's somebody that you trust more, there's somebody that you're going to for your acceptance and understanding that isn't your partner. All right, so let's say in your main relationship you've got three out of five pillars. You're missing emotional and intellectual intimacy. So now you go and you find that with somebody else. You find this smart person and it starts off with just like good intellectual conversations but then you get to know each other on a really deep level. You find that you can share yourself with this person. You feel accepted. You feel understood. I think the big problem with that is if you're the type of person who needs or requires that in a relationship, it's going to really point out really quick that you're missing that in your main relationship. And it might... I think what's caused me in the past is... I now go back to my main relationship and I start trying to get it. Like I start working really hard. How can I boost the emotional intimacy in the relationship to get what I have with this friend of mine over here? And I guess what I'm trying to say is I think it's awkward if you've got better emotional intimacy with a friend than you do with your main romantic partner. So if you've got a friend that you've now built this really strong emotional connection with and, you know, like let's say you have a major win in your life or you have some kind of struggle or like you need somebody there to support you, who do you go to? You know, if you're going to somebody other than your partner for that support, it might be a bit of a, a red flag that you're going elsewhere for your main source of emotional intimacy. And to be honest, if that's you, I don't think you should feel like alone about that. I think that a lot of relationships are in that, in that situation. Like the last year I've been really interested in relationships and I've talked to a lot of my friends, a lot of acquaintances about it. And I don't want to be sound kind of depressing, but it seems like a lot of relationships most relationships are not that strong. They're not as strong as I would like it to be. I guess what I would like in a relationship is five out of five. Somebody that I feel a deep sense of emotional intimacy to. Somebody who 
I have good intellectual intimacy with. So if you're actually physically attracted to a person, let's say you're like wildly attracted to this person, if you have good emotional and intellectual stimulation, I think it just naturally follows you're probably going to have, you know, great physical and sexual intimacy with that person. I think it does happen sometimes where you have good emotional and intellectual intimacy with a person, but you're just not attracted to them. And in that case, you know, that's, that's like a good friend. So I think you can actually go through a relationship and let's say you have four to five, but you have emotional intimacy. Um, I think you have a pretty good relationship. And I think that you can substitute any of the pillars for a friend, except for emotional intimacy. So for example, let's say you're in a romantic relationship and you have four of the five pillars. And the one that you're missing is the intellectual intimacy. But they still have a deep level of emotional connection. Let's say they have shared values. Let's say they have great physical and sexual intimacy that's based on the emotional intimacy. And let's say they have great quality time. I think that relationship can actually be quite successful and quite fulfilling. However, because they don't get that intellectual stimulation, and it may possibly be that one person in the relationship does feel intellectually stimulated because they're with this intellectual person, but it doesn't change the fact that the other person, the more intellectual of the two, might feel like they're not being stimulated enough or they don't really have a deep intellectual connection in that relationship. In that case, that person should be fine going and getting a friend who they can have some good intellectual conversations with. And it's possible they can kind of meet their needs that way. Let's say your values aren't really on the same page. So I think this is a little bit more challenging, but still possible to have a good relationship. Like let's say one person is more religious than the other person. Well, in that case, as long as you have communication and you can actually communicate these things to each other with good emotional intimacy and you can come to a level of understanding, and I think that is absolutely key. You have to have good communication to actually come to an understanding. You know, you know, you can actually work it out. Okay, well, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to do my thing here. You, you can stay home. You can not partake in that activity. And although the one person might love it if, if the, if the other person came to church with them, they kind of accept that person enough to be like, okay, in this case, we don't have shared values. And this thing that's important to me may not be that important to you. So in that case, you know, that person might join some kind of group or friendship circle that actually does have some other people with those shared values so they can actually get those needs met. So I think one thing to note about this rating system is that it can change over time. Like let's say, you've got four to five pillars with somebody and you go and get married. You know, it's possible, like let's say you're missing one of the items. Um, it's possible that you could work on that thing and actually build into that over time and now your relationship actually gets stronger and now you've got five out of five on the pillars and I think that's the best situation. Like let's say you get married and your relationship isn't really that strong, but let's say it's the strongest relationship you've ever had so you don't really know any better. You think, no, I mean, this is, this is a pretty good relationship and I think I can make this work. So you get married and you've got three out of five. Like let's say you don't really have great emotional intimacy after all, and you don't really have good intellectual intimacy, but it turns out you have great quality time. You know, like you shared interests. You're both really into the same things. Let's say you got shared values. Let's say you're from the exact same background. Let's say you're, you know, the same religious beliefs, things like that. Um, and then let's say you're attracted to each other and you have good physical intimacy. Even though I said before that I think really good physical sexual intimacy is based on emotional intimacy. Let's say you don't know any better. You've never had a relationship where you have really good emotional intimacy. So you've got three out of the five. You get married. Um, and then as time goes on, let's say one person, you know, starts to change their values. And let's say one person doesn't change their values. So now you've got two people kind of moving away from each other in their values. And then over time, let's say that person changes their values. And now you no longer have shared values. Now you've gone from three out of five down to two out of five. And really all you have left is, you know, some quality time, like shared interests, and maybe you were physically attracted to each other. But let's say over time, you know, the physical attraction starts to kind of wear off because you know the emotional intimacy isn't there bolstering up 
that physical connection. And now really all you have left is you're just like sports buddies, let's say, or like, you know, you, you both like to tango dance. I don't know. In the end, you've, you've gone, when you were first married, you had three out of five. Now you've kind of moved to two or one out of five, or it could be possible you have zero to five. Like, what do you do in that situation? I think that's a hard situation to be in. And I think really the only choice you have in that situation is to try to build those things up or end the relationship. Those are the only two choices. But I personally think that living in a state of a bad relationship, to me anyway, that feels, it's almost just like torture and agony. And I will do whatever I can to try to build that back. But then what if it just doesn't work? So that's an awkward problem. Like what, what about if you can't, you've, you've moved, your values are moving in different directions and you can't get to a place where you have shared values anymore? What if you just don't feel accepted? You don't feel understood. You know, you don't have intellectual intimacy. So I guess in conclusion, I've got these five pillars of relationship. And I guess if you're moving towards a relationship or you're trying to get a new relationship, maybe this will help you kind of give you a bit of goal on how to define what a good relationship even looks like. A lot of times people are like, oh, I, I feel good in this relationship, but they don't really know why or how. At least I feel like with this, I can kind of explain why. Oh, I have really good emotional intimacy. I have really good intellectual intimacy. I, oh, actually, you know, our, you know, our values are, are a little different. Well, maybe we can work on that, right? Maybe we can come to some kind of understanding about that and kind of identify it. Um, if you're thinking of moving into a relationship and any of these items are not checked off, you might, you know, especially like a marriage relationship, I think it's smart to try to tick as many of these boxes as you can before you get married to a person. Because like I said, if you lose one or two over time, if you have five out of five and you lose one or two and now you're down to four to five or three to five, you know, you can probably still make that relationship work. But if you start a relationship with, you know, two or three, and then you lose a couple, you know, you might be in a really tough place um, with not really having much left. This relationship's just hanging on with a thread. Anyway, I hope this isn't depressing. I hope that this wasn't a depressing thing. I, I really don't want to, like, make anybody feel depressed about the relationship after I sort of point these things out. If anything, I hope it's just an encouragement or more of like a tool that you can use to try to identify relationship problems and then work towards repairing them. Anyway, as I said, this is all just a bunch of theories that I've come up with. If you have any thoughts on it or want to add anything or feel like maybe you know something I said wasn't quite correct, feel free to leave a comment below and, uh, or a question and we can talk about it. All right, guys, thanks for checking it out. Have a great day.